So you mentioned Gandhian nonviolence, and people also talk about Kingian nonviolence. Is there a particular flavor of King's approach to nonviolence that could be differentiated from Gandhi or other nonviolence leaders? Now you're getting into something that I, I, I find, um, you know, I, I, when you look at at, at Gandhi, uh, he was very uneasy with the notion of Gandhiism. That that there's that complex ideas can just be reduced to a set of, you know, a number of principles, and and if you get people to say they believe in those principles, then you've accomplished the goal. Um, I think that that King, first of all, understood that whatever his ideas about nonviolence, he was only one force in a much larger movement. That where a lot of the initiative came from below rather than above, he couldn't simply just say, "Well, you know, I've thought this issue through, and I think that all the people in this movement should use this strategy and this these tactics." He could say that, but he would know that that's not the way the movement worked. Um, the four students in Greensboro, they didn't do what they did because they heard a speech by Martin Luther King and decided to act. They didn't really listen to, they, they consult with any adult. They developed a, a tactic. They didn't even know the name of the tactic. Um, and I think it was originally called a, a sit-down because they sat down at a lunch counter. And only later was it called a, a sit-in. So these 18-year-old first-year students in college really uh, launched a, a new phase of the movement. The, kind of uh, similarly with the freedom rights. You had other people who uh, were, uh, went through, had their own understanding of, of nonviolence. Um, you had other leaders in the movement, James Lawson, who probably had a deeper understanding initially than King did of, of nonviolence. He had lived in India and, uh, and certainly understood Gandhi and nonviolence better. And I think King himself, if you look at it, he developed most of his ideas through practice. That, and he states this explicitly a number of times, that in the course of the Montgomery movement, he learned certain things about nonviolence that he didn't know before. And similarly, during the Birmingham campaign, I think it's really only in Birmingham that he begins to formulate these in terms, uh, you know, the letter from Birmingham jail is probably the best formulation that he ever wrote about um, the justification for civil disobedience. Um, so I think that King understood that, that this was something complex, something that evolved over time, something that he, as Martin Luther King, didn't have complete control over, that there were other voices in, in that discussion, other people who um, had their own notions. And, and what that meant is that in crucial instances, like in Birmingham, he was undecided what to do. Uh, when, it, when it actually came down to that crucial point of, do I go to jail or do I not go to jail? There was nothing in his ideas about nonviolence that could answer that question. That had to be decided by the issue of what was, um, what did he think would, would work in a situation that he had never been in before. And, and I think my own view is that that's typically what happens in most nonviolent movements. Uh, some of it is obviously influenced by people who have studied um, this tradition going back to Thoreau and, and Tolstoy and people like that. Um, but others are simply uh, ordinary people trying to make their lives and the lives of those around them more, more just, trying to gain a measure of dignity, and who innovate. And that innovation comes from the bottom up. 
And I think that's why there's hundreds of nonviolent tactics that have been developed in movements around the world. Um, all of them effective to some degree, and each movement makes its own contribution to the tradition of nonviolent resistance.